Baptist Church. There's no stopping now. There's no stopping now. We're about to get what we came for. We're about to get what we came for. Satan thought he won a battle, but he didn't know it was a war. I can tell you this. If there's some bondage in here, God's about to break it. And if there's some territory in here, we're about to take it. This is what we came for. First Baptist, it's the preaching time. First Baptist, it's the preaching time. Welcome the man of God with the word of God. you but we've been praying for this moment for a long time God has given us this vision for a while and that's okay because any good thing sometimes can take some time and God has been visioning for us as God has done at First Baptist for so long trying to help us understand First Baptist the harvest is plentiful the opportunities are plentiful the ways to reach people for the kingdom are plentiful. And, and First Baptist, we've been answering that call time and time again, hearing what God has to say. We call it the Saturday Surge, first of all, because it's Saturday, but we call it the Surge because if you look up the definition of the word surge, it means a sudden, powerful, forward and upward movement. That sounds like God to me. God is always doing things powerfully and sometimes suddenly, but it's always forward and upward with God. So we call it the Saturday surge. Look at your neighbor and say, welcome to the Saturday surge. So again, this is, this is a 60-minute, maximum 60-minute uplifting life application worship service and, and I've been listening and watching and this has been amazing and beautiful and so we are excited about what God is doing so we want to get into the word now for those of you who typically come on Sunday I'm going to do things a little different again this is not Sunday 2.0 and so I'm going to be in a little different mode I'm trying to do a hybrid I'm trying to figure it out and if it don't necessarily work don't say nothing go with it But I'm trying to do a hybrid between Bible study and sermon, and if you will. And so we're going to be studying a whole lot of scriptures. So take your electronic Bibles out. Take your hard copies of your Bibles out because we're going to be going through the Bible. We're going to be looking at several verses as we look at what's going on uh, in the Word of God today. And so we're going to be doing it that way. Now, And I want to start with a word of prayer, as I always do. I know we pray for but I want to pray for the Word moment. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you are so good. Everything you make is good. You made this day. You made us. You made a way. And Lord, you have brought us into your vision. You brought us into what you have called us to be. And, and Lord, sometimes it's been difficult for us to wrap our arms around it, but I know you, God, that's okay, because sometimes, as you say, our ways are not your ways and our thoughts are not your thoughts. But Lord, we are your people of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so we hear you, Father. Help us to expand the kingdom of God, Father. Help us to bring in the harvest for those who have never known you. Lord, let this Saturday surge be an opportunity for those who've been afraid to come in the doors on Sunday to find their way in on Saturday. Those who've been hurt by a church somewhere, somewhere in their past or walked away and want to find their way back, Lord, let them know that this Saturday surge is a way for you to be a movement, a powerful movement in their life, forward and upward in you. For those, Lord, who have schedules with Sunday because of their jobs, they've got to work on Sunday that they can be here and still walk with you and grow with you and be loved by you and hear from you and to thank you for every good and perfect gift in their lives. Lord, let this be for them. Lord, we do it all for your glory. We ask that you would be glorified in this, Lord Jesus. 
that hearts would be changed, those who know you well, those who are just starting the journey, and those who have yet to begin. Lord, let us tell a dying world that you still love and save. Let us let our light shine and be the salt of the earth. And so, Father, we thank you for this moment. Move us forward and upward in you, Lord, in our lives, in every circumstance that you plant our feet. May we find them on your solid ground. Lord, this is our prayer. Almighty Yahweh, even greater we offer it is our praise. For it's in the name of your Son, who is our Savior, Jesus the Christ, we do ask it and pray. And all who would agree would gladly say, Amen. Amen. One of the things as we look at this, uh, this kickoff Saturday service and I think about what it is that God would have us to know today. And, and one of the things that had me look at, and I was going to tell you the title, but I'll wait until I finish this part, the, the title of the message that God has. Again, it's not Sunday 2.0, so it's not one text that we're going through. It's kind of a Bible study. But if you look in the, the, the Jesus says something that was so important that he had to put it in all the synoptic gospels. He had to put it in the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They called it the synoptic because they are similar in the message that they are telling, but they're telling the totally different audiences, so they tell them in different ways. But this one parable was so important that they put it in all of them, and we know it as the parable of the sower, or better yet, the parable of the soils. I like that second one, the parable of the soils, where Jesus is talking about it because he's helping us understand some things where in that parable, Jesus is talking about the ground. But he's talking about there are four types of ground where, where things happen and if they're going to grow, he helps us to understand there's only one type of ground where we can grow in God. And he talks about the first one and he gives the parable and he tells it to the public and they don't get it and his disciples don't get it. So they ask him and prophets say, what do you mean by the parable? And he says, let me tell you because the secrets of the kingdom are not for those who don't want to really hear but for those who want to do. So he says, let me explain the parable. When he talked about the parable who sowed the sower, who sowed a seed, the seed is the word of God. He said, the first ground that you see is the ground of the pathway. That ground is hard. That ground has people trample on it. It's the roadway. And he says, because people trample on that, when the seed falls on that ground, it does not reap a harvest because the devil comes. And since that ground is so hard that they can't let the seed in, the devil has easy pickings, if you will, for God's word so it never takes root in the person. That ground can't produce anything. Then he says, but some seed fell along some soil that was called rocky ground. It's called rocky because it's got a lot of rocks under it. The soil is very thin and it's got a lot of gravel and rocks. You got any, uh, you ever try to dig in your household, in your yard, and you hit a rock as soon as you try to put it in? It's that type of ground. He says, because of that, the seed will try to germinate, but because it has very thin soil, it doesn't have a lot of soil, right under it really is a rock that when persecution comes, when the heat of trouble comes, when problems comes, when bills come due, when persecution happens, because they can't get any root because of the rock that's there, it says that they fade away and suddenly die. That ground can't produce any growing iron. Then he says there's another seed, and this one has a little more effective. It's, this seed is, it, it has soil that it can grow in, it can take root in, and it does. But what happens, he says that there's some thorns, or some translations say some weeds come up, and, and they grow up with the seed. And though it's good soil, it's good soil for the word, but also the weeds grow up with it. You ever had an issue where you trying to grow something, and the weeds are growing up right there with it, saying, as you go, I go. And he's saying that we got problems like that. We got things that happen in our lives that want to choke off what God is trying to do in our life. He says the thorns come up, the weeds come up, and they choke off what God has started to grow as good ground because of all the things we worry about in our lives. Oh, I got enough money. Am I driving the right car? Am I around the right people? Am I doing the right things? And do I have the right stuff? That all of a sudden, instead of focusing on God, we focus on old things, and old things suck the oxygen out of our lives, out of our marriages, out of our careers, out of, of, of what God would have for us. It's good ground, but it doesn't produce any growing because we let the world choke it to death. 
But he names one soil that's really good. And he says, this is good ground. This soil is really good. And the seed falls on there. There are no weeds in it. There are no thorns. Now, here's the thing. He doesn't say that they won any, but for one reason or another, they get cultivated out. The thorns are not there. The weeds are not there. It's good soil. It goes deep, and it takes root. And because of that, it grows. That one seed reproduces itself 30, 60, even 100-fold. And when I thought about that, I said what God is trying to get us to understand is that if we're going to be what God has wants for you in your life, what God wants for you, you've got to make yourself God. You have to let God make you good growing ground. That's really the title I want to give this is growing ground. Tell your neighbor growing ground. And so God wants us to understand that if you're going to be what God would have you to be, if you're going to be encouraged through the hard times and the difficult times, that you've got to say, Lord, make me good growing ground. And growing ground is that ground where the thorns can't have their way, the weeds can't have their way. Oh, they're going to try and, and the rocks get removed, Lord, that you got to help move some of these rocks. And other rocks, Lord, going to say, you got no strength moving for yourself. But we want this to be good growing ground. The question is, how do we get there? one of the things we got to understand is that we are always a work in progress and when you look at all things that's going on when when Benita and first lady and I were when we found out we were pregnant with our children she was carrying Keith just like we all do we find out we have our child and before that child is even born and today you have these all fancy parties about revealing whether it's a boy or a girl look all we wanted to do is doc look at the sonogram is that a boy or a girl just let me know and once we found out, that's when we started saying, what's going to be the child's name? What, and, and we start dreaming about his name's going to be this or her name's going to be that. And we start dreaming, don't we, about what our child's already going to be and how we want them to grow up. And Lord, we just, you know, we want them to be healthy, but maybe they're going to be a, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer or something. We start coming with all these dreams and that's good, these hopes and dreams. And God wants us to know that the same way that we dream about our children, that God is doing the same with us saying, yeah, I'm creating you. I'm, I'm, I'm forming you in the womb. And I've got visions for you and I got dreams for you but but sometimes we for, we forget that God has that for us we forget that we are a work in progress. Our children did not come out of the womb a 35-year-old man or woman, perfect in their career at the top of whatever they were going to do. They came out as infants who were weak, and we had to nourish them, and we had to love them, and we had to bond with them so that they could continue to grow to be what God would have them to be. And God wants us to understand the same thing. We didn't give up on our children because they didn't act right at 18 months of age, because they didn't act right at six months, because they didn't get it right at five years of age, but we continue to pray for them and hope for them and continue to nourish them and God wants to do the same thing that growing ground is a lifelong process for your life for your marriage for your family for your health for your job for you we are work in progress but the question is have we forgotten that do have you forgotten the vision that God has for your life because if you've forgotten it if you've never learned it, I can tell you now, you're not growing. You're not growing the way God would have you to grow. That, that God wants us to understand that because one of the most exciting, but also one of the most intimidating things we can ever hear from God is exciting, but it's also intimidating, is this. I've got a vision for you. That's exciting because that means God has something for us. But it's intimidating because we know God, sometimes the things that God has for us don't come easy. Sometimes we got to go through some things, and that's not necessarily bad, but the truth is we don't like to go through some things. But it's exciting when God says he's got a vision for you. He's got a vision for your life. He's got a vision for your marriage. He's got a vision for your family. He's got a vision for your children. He's got a vision for your church. It's exciting, but it's also intimidating because that means God says, I'm going to get you there, but you might have to go through getting there. And we got to ask ourselves, Lord, what's my vision? And if we don't know what it is, it's because something's going on. And, and if you don't know what it is, here's the why not why you don't know what it is. There's a couple things of reason why. If you don't know what your vision is, here's three possibilities why you don't know what God's vision is for your life. Instead of realizing you are work in progress, you believe that you are work completed, you are work impossible, or you are work doubtful. 
Some of us, we already think we got it. We there. I, God, I'm not a work in progress. I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm good. I, you don't have to bother me. Don't try to get me no more. I got what I got. Some think that if I reach a certain level in my finances that I'm good. I'm a work completed and you still got things going on in your life. But some of us think that we already there. I don't think it's anybody here. It might be in some other churches, but it ain't here. But some, we got some folk who think they are work completed. But some of us, because of the mess we've gone through, because of the hell we had to walk through, some of us have gotten to the point because we've been so wounded, we think that we are work impossible. God, you can't do anything else with this. I wrecked this so bad. I messed up my circumstance. Folk have messed me up, hurt me, sent me the wrong way so bad that God, it is impossible. And we've given up on God. Walked away from God, walked away from believing that anything can be better than what the misery I've come through. But some folk aren't there yet, but you on your way, you are work doubtful. You doubting what God can do because, God, you ain't done it yet. Things ain't right the way they're supposed to be. Lord, I asked you for this. I, I asked you that if you would do this and do that. But we begin to doubt ourselves that God can do anything. Even our churches, sometimes we become doubtful. We aren't, we, we aren't working possible, but we are work doubtful. And when we start doubting, we start thinking that God can't do anything. We think our past is what is set for our today. Our yesterday has set the path for whatever's coming tomorrow. And we begin to think that nothing can be better or worse than what we've already done yesterday. And yesterday is going to be my my today and my tomorrow. And when we think that way, we become convinced and we begin to say things that, Lord, don't even bother with me. I'm not the one. You need to look to somebody else. You don't have to believe me. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Here it is that Moses, who was born, born a Hebrew, but grew up in the Egyptian family and royalty, but then finds himself, ah, he finds himself now, he's 40 years of age, he's on the run from Pharaoh because he killed the Egyptian, and now he's with the Midianites, and he's been with them for 40 years, and now he's 80 years of age, and God is coming to Moses and saying, Moses, I got a vision for you. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I'm going to read it from the message translation. I like how it says it because Moses is at a point where he is work impossible and work doubtful. He, listen, this is God. Moses raised another objection to God. Master, please, I don't talk well. I've never been good with words, neither before nor after you spoke with, to me. I stutter and stammer. God said, who do you think made the human mouth? Who makes some mute, some deaf, some sighted, some blind? Isn't it I, God? So get going. I'll be right there with you, with your mouth. I'll be right there to teach you what to say. Watch this. Moses, after God is saying, I'm going to be there, but because he's, he's a work, doubtful work, impossible at the moment, listen to how he answers God who just said, Moses, I know you stutter. I know you stammer. I know about you. I made you. But because he's there, listen to how he answers in the same way we do sometimes. He said, oh, master, please send somebody else. God, go through somebody else's street. I, I'm not the one, God. I've had too many things go on in my life. I've made too many mistakes. Lord, you've got to be looking for somebody else. Maybe you're looking for a Keith, but I ain't the Keith that you're looking for. Maybe you're looking to help somebody else's marriage, but my marriage is too jacked up. Maybe you're looking to help somebody else in their health or in their relationships, but Lord, no, you got the wrong person. Sometimes when we get to the work impossible, work doubtful, we tell God, Lord, please send somebody else. Go somebody else. Say, you can't do nothing with this, Lord. And then we find ourselves in this circumstance, in these situations, but God wants us to understand it's just like a baby who wants to grow, craves milk. If you baby, how many of you have children? And you know when your babies were young, when they started to cry, one or two things were going on. They were hungry or they needed to be changed. 
We call them fussy, but they weren't fussy. They were fighting to grow. Children, when they are hungry, are going to cry out, and they're going to say, listen, my body is saying I want to grow, and I need to eat, and so you need to feed me. And the Bible tells us that we need to be like children. We need to be like babies who are craving the spiritual milk that God has for us so that we might grow on growing ground and be what God calls us to be. You don't have to believe me. Peter said it himself. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, the first two verses. Really, you can go to the third verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read it from the NIV and the message translation. Therefore, it is in the NIV. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may watch this grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Listen how the message translation say it. So clean house God. Make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. You, you've had a taste of God. Now like infants at the breast drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you'll grow up mature and whole in God. Sometimes we aren't grow because somewhere along the line, instead of us craving the milk, we're starving ourselves of God's hopes and visions. Instead of craving what God would have for us because we aren't asking God to do it and we don't realize we're, cra we're starving ourselves from, from the visions and the hopes and the plans that God has for us. And he wants us to understand that when you do that, you've forgotten that you are a work in progress. You thought, God, I should be further along than I am. I should be as far along as somebody else that I'm comparing myself to. But nobody made you anything but what God made you. You are who God made you and God has a progress for you that's for you and not for somebody else. But we got to realize that we are work in progress. We fail sometimes, but we are work in progress. We mess up sometimes, but we are work in progress. We go the wrong way sometimes, but we are work in progress. We even turn our back on God sometimes, but God understands we are a work in progress, not a work in possible. Some of us wake up every morning, and the first thing we do is, I got to get up. You wake up, and the first thing you're mad about is you got to get up. But what would it be like if you, if you woke up in the morning and said, good morning, Lord. I'm glad you woke me up this morning, because that means you brought me through yesterday, and you got a brand new today for me. What if we did that? And I don't know about you, but, but baby, I like today's. I like every new today because every new today tells me that I made it through a yesterday. Every new today tells me that what tried to take me out yesterday didn't work. I like today's because they remind me what didn't work yesterday. God's got a new ease or a new portrait to work with today. I like today's because today's remind me that yesterday is not the end of my story. Yesterday is not the final chapter in my life. Yesterday is not the epilogue to my journey of what God has for me, that what God has for me. If God woke me up today, God is saying, good morning, Keith. I got a vision for you. Good morning. I got an idea for you. I like today because that means I made it through yesterday. Some of us get stuck in our yesterdays. Issues coming. We can't get past yesterday's. I can ask some of you now, and you can tell me about your 10 years ago yesterday. Your 20 year ago pain of yesterday. You can tell me about what's happening in your yesterday, but God wants you to hear God clearly and tell you that if God woke you up today, God is saying, good morning, I got a vision for you today. Maybe yesterday was rough. Listen, I ain't, you know, maybe it was rough. Shoo, I know sometimes it's rough. Maybe it was exhausting. Maybe it was trying. Maybe it was one of those they plucking my last nerves type yesterday. Maybe it was even shameful. But it's behind you. God wants you to know that it's behind you. Listen to this. Don't let your yesterday define your right now with God. 
Don't let your yesterday define your right now. Yesterday is gone, but God has given you a right now moment that you might grow, that he might say, listen, I know you went through some things. It's not foreign to me. I know you did, but I'm, I'm preparing the ground for you that you might grow and become what I want you to be. Grow in your walk with me so that you might let your light shine and be the salt that God has called you to do. And, and you are a work in progress, and God wants you to grow from where you are right here, right now. What does that growing look like? Two things, and then I'm done. First thing, when it comes to what, what uh, with God's growth, what it is, here's the first thing. God's growth comes from the inside and flows to the outside. God's growth starts on the inside and flows to the outside. Turn to Romans chapter 12 with me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is what it says. Listen from the NIV and then from the message. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The message translation says it this way. Don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. Watch this. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Well, God wants us to know that, that Paul only uses this word a second time, and he, the only time Paul uses this word transform, this transformation word, one of the time is in 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to read it from you, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed. There's that word. It's the only second time Paul ever uses it within the New Testament of being transformed into his likeness and ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Message translation, and so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming bright and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. What's really about now? What is he saying is that Growth is not a matter of improving the package, the wrapping. It's a matter of improving the product in the wrapping. That too often we're trying to say, well, maybe if I just look the part, if I look like I've got it going on, if I look like things are going right, don't act like we don't do it. We show up on that job, we tore up from the bottom up, and we'll come up and try to say, well, if I'm driving the right car, if I'm living in the right house, I got the right people around me, and I'm wearing the right clothes. But how I many know that you can be as fake as you want to be, even though it look real, you still fake as you want to be? It's not a matter of improving the wrapping, the packaging. It's a matter of improving the product in the package. That starts from the inside coming out. In other words, this is an inside job. That's why David said in Psalm 51, create in me, God, a pure heart and renew a right spirit within me, God. This has got to start from the inside so that it can show up on the outside. Lord, you got to start inside so my marriage can be right on the outside. Lord, it's got to start on the inside so my mind can be right on the outside. Not only that, but God's growth must also be forward and upward. One of the things I do when I'm coming to a close, one of the things that I do is I, I fly planes. I fly planes. Yeah, I, mean, I, I fly planes. I'm licensed. I fly the Saab 340, the ATR 42. I, I fly the Embry 80, the Embry 90, the Boeing M80, the Boeing M90. I fly the 717 and the 737. I fly them. I got a license to fly them on my Android phone. And I'm now senior captain on my phone. One of the things I noticed that when flying planes, it's totally different than the other forms of transportation. Whether you are walking, whether you're riding a car, driving a, riding a bicycle, a, a train, a, a battleship, a boat, any of those, you can stop or even reverse and not be in danger. I can walk and stop 
or even reverse and not be in danger. Do the same on a bike, a car, or all the other things. But in an airplane, there's only one way to continue to fly safe. That's forward and upward. And God wants you to understand that if you're going to be good growing ground, God, that's where we get this surge from. This is a powerful forward and upward motion. God says, I got a vision for your life, and I want to move you forward and upward. I got a vision for your marriage. I want to move it forward and upward. I got a vision for your health. I want to move it forward and upward. But you got to believe that God is able to do what God is able to do in your life. You got to say, God, I need you to move me forward and upward in what you would have for me. So when you find yourself caught up in life struggles, when you find that you've made mistakes and don't feel like even showing up, when you find that God is doing some things in your life and people just don't seem to believe you, let the Lord reproduce Jesus in you. Because here's something that I learned with Jesus when it comes to growing ground. Calvary can be your growing ground. Here's what I mean by that. Just like Calvary was meant to kill Jesus. It was the place where Jesus was elevated with all power in his hand. The thing that was meant to destroy him became the very thing that actually elevated him. And, and I want you to understand that God wants to do the same thing with you, that the place that was meant to bury you, the place that the devil thought he had you, the place where the devil meant to bury you can be the very ground that God uses to elevate you, the place where the devil thought he could destroy you can be the very place you prove that the devil's a liar and God has a vision for me the very place that God had to destroy you can be the very ground Calvary that God uses to save you that's what God wants you to know today God wants to move you forward and upward in the very thing that tried to destroy you your marriage your health your vision your career can be the very ground that God uses to elevate you and all he's asking you to do is saying, Lord, here I am. Till the soil of my heart, my mind, and my soul. Because I want to be growing ground. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm going to be growing ground. And time and time again, God finds a way of saying, look at here, Keith. The very thing that the devil tried to destroy you with is the very ground I tilled to show that the devil's a liar and to elevate you in life. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, that's good growing ground. And come on, give God some praise. That's good growing ground. And the question becomes, where are you in that? What soil are you right now? Oh, maybe you think you're good, but what about your relationships? What about your health? Have you heard from God and saying, I got an idea, I got a vision for you. For whatever you're going through, God woke you up today to tell you, I've got more for you. I've got better for you. I've got greater for you. I've got a surge of favor and grace and overcoming and victory for you, but you've got to be willing to hear the Lord. And so I want you to think for a moment. God, my marriage is not what it should be, but but I need you to toil the so soil of our hearts, minds, and souls that we might hear your vision for us. Put us aside, Lord. Remove the rocks within our way. Maybe it's in your own circumstance, and because of the hurt and pain that you legitimately have been dealing with, that you put yourself in a work doubtful, but God is saying, don't doubt you because I got you. Let me show you what I have for you. And so God wants you to think about where you are today. Where are you in your walk with God? 